Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a new episode of Political Economy of Forbes 15. My name is Niklas Hintermeyer. I'm a journalist of the German-speaking issue of Forbes, and I'm very pleased to welcome my guest today. It's Christina Leib. She's senior counsel and previously senior water resources specialist at the World Bank in Washington, D.C. So, Christina, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Let's start with a, with a broader question. Mm -hmm. When it comes to your duties and responsibilities as a senior counsel, also like previously as a senior water resources specialist at the World Bank, what are you responsible in detail for? So a senior counsel, which is a position which I took on last year, I'm primarily responsible for the bank's policy on projects on international waterways. Uh, that means the World Bank has a policy where we notify projects which we're Im implementing that, that use or risk polluting shared water resources. We notify them to other riparian countries and also to other concerned states because it's very important that other countries that use the same resource are informed about these projects. And for us, it's important to keep a good relationship with our member states and making sure that the information flows and our investments are transparent. And otherwise, I deal also with other environmental law issues, public international law issues that concern our investments. And as senior water resources specialist previously, I also dealt with shared water resources. So I've always been um, engaged in the World Bank on transboundary water resource management. As senior water resources specialist, my latest position was to work as the global focal point on transboundary water management and also to lead the bank's Central Asia Energy and Water Development Program, uh, which is called CAWEP, which is a, a partnership with uh, Switzerland, the European Union, and the United Kingdom through DFID. It's a multi-donor trust fund that funds national and regional um, investments, technical assistance, capacity building, dialogue to promote uh, national and regional water security in Central Asia and in Afghanistan. So it's an, an integrated program. Um, very interesting because you're mentioning you like your time as program manager for the Central Asia Water and Energy Development Program. It's about like, uh, to put it uh, simple now, um, uh, to, to improving like the energy, food and water securities like in security in Central Asia by strengthening these energy water linkages across the Central Asia region. Could you outline a little bit also from your time, um, concrete outcomes or concrete outcomes from projects that you led in this region previously? Yeah, so basically the, the program works on, on various levels. It works at the national level, helping countries identify um, projects or policy uh, changes that will help them to uh, promote national and water and energy security. And there we worked, for instance, a lot with the Kyrgyz Republic and Tajikistan to identify measures that will help them in their energy efficiency. Both countries are struggling, have been struggling with uh, energy uh, security, in particular in winter time when they need a lot of uh, electricity for heating and they've sort of had problems with load shedding in the winter time and not being able to supply enough electricity. So one of the aspects is to really make sure that um, energy users sort of use electricity efficiently. But we have also helped identifying uh, new investments. Um, for instance, the Central Asia, South Asia Transmission Interconnection Project. It's a one billion investment that involves Kyrgyz Republic, Tajikistan, Afghanistan and also Pakistan. It's building a long trans transmission line because the hydropower um, development and plants in Central Asia um, produce excess electricity in summertime or have the capacity to produce additional electricity in summertime when they're releasing water for irrigation downstream. And sort of this transmission line is really to evacuate this electricity to South Asia where there's a high electricity demand in the summertime for, for instance, irrigation pumping, but also for their industries. Um, another program that we worked on um, and helped prepare it is the Central Asia Climate Mitigation and Adaptation Program. It's an about $30 million investment to build capacity in the countries to become more um, climate resilient. 
to invest in um, sort of climate adaptation, in particular in the agricultural sector for smallholder farmers, for the private farms that they have um, converted to um, part of the land after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, we have also invested in uh, hydropower rehabilitation. Uh, one of the key investments is the rehabilitation of the Nurek hydropower plant in Tajikistan. That's a plant that was built in the 1960s and 70s and um, delivers more than 70% of the, of the Tajik energy um, generation. And that, that plant was working at 77% of its capacity. So the rehabilitation is really to bring up the capacity even beyond its previous um, um, power generation. And the first phase of this investment is co-financed with AIIB. I think uh, actually Austrian company Andritz Hydro has been contracted by the Tajik government to carry out the rehabilitation. Currently, um, the bank is preparing a second phase of rehabilitation, which will um, rehabilitate the six remaining generation units. So it's a very important investment, in particularly also now as the countries are rebuilding their regional transmission network between in Central Asia and as power trade with uh, downstream countries is sort of picking up as energy and electricity demand is just increasing everywhere with, with uh, increased economic development, increased industrialization, privatization. When it comes to like energy and the water systems, like in Central Asia, what you were talking about, they're really inextricably intertwined. How much of an, like an, of a challenge is it? Or like also like in the other hand as an advantage? Because I think like, like a major challenge was also like after the Soviet um, collapse of the Soviet Union that they had a very common system and then they had to uh, transition transit like to change it to a more shared with the up, up, downstream and upstream countries what you mentioned before but like to, to come back to my question what are really the, the challenges but also may, maybe advantages that these energy and water systems are that much intertwined yeah so as you said i mean that the challenge for the countries was that after the soviet so collapse of the soviet union they really inherited a slightly oversized and aged infrastructure that was focused on delivering irrigation water to downstream countries for heavy agricultural production. There was, in a way, over abstraction of water resources from upstream of the RLC, which also contributed to the shrinking of the RLC. And then the upstream uh, storage infrastructure was really designed to store water upstream so that it could be released in the summertime for irrigation. And that whole system was backed up with a sort of energy for water exchange where the downstream countries, which are primarily fossil fuel energy rich, would then deliver winter energy to the countries to compensate the upstream countries for storing the water uh, for summer releases for irrigation. And then when the whole system collapsed and all these countries sort of emerged as uh, independent uh, states, there was on the one hand this trend um, of the countries to reassert them as national sort of as their sort of individual states. And at the same time, so this whole system of power exchange and water exchange in a way collapsed because now the, the downstream countries had also access to, you know, international markets, the um, fossil fuel energy prices went up. So it was more, um, made more economic sense for them to export the energy resources into other countries rather than sort of supplying them to upstream countries. And for a while, that system had almost completely collapsed. And currently, the countries are really working together to rebuild this system, but in a different way. Because um, one thing that is important is to now also look at what are the climate change impacts on water flows. There are changes in rainfall and the hydrologic regime of rivers. So the Water flows are a little bit delayed in springtime. Um, glaciers are melting. So then the question is on how much water is, will be available overall. So the countries are currently very much looking at the science and this data and are, are devising strategies on how to rebuild that system in a different way. So they are reestablishing a lot of the transmission lines, strengthening them, um, 
probably also looking at how could downstream renewable energy production, where you have a lot of solar energy potential, for instance, also feed into this regional transmission system. At the same time, also looking at how can these upstream reservoirs really be used to regulate the water storage also in times of climate change. So it's a question of rebuilding this system of regional integration in a different way that takes account of the fact that these are now sort of independent countries with independently run economies, but also of changing hydrological conditions that the countries are already facing and will be facing in the next 50, 100 years down the road when the climate change impacts will just become more extreme. Let's move a little bit to, to a different topic, like to transboundary basin projects, because I found also like a report from the, from the World Bank, I think it was a blog post, that due to the nature of the transboundary basin projects, there, there are a variety of nuances and complexities. For example, the uniqueness of each hydrologic system, the, uh, the multiple countries that are involved, the different legal responsibilities, structures and institutional mandates on the one hand as advantages, but also like on the other hand, the opportunities of sharing benefits and costs. Like you, as a broad question, how to overcome these complexities in, in the first step or what has to be done like very to also maybe to reach, to reach a legal framework, what has to be done as a first step when such uh, different countries are involved? Uh, as you said, every basin is different. <laughs> so there's uh, every, so water, I mean, the fascinating thing about water is that it's not only it's sort of a natural resource, but it also plays into um, culture and how societies relate to water. It plays into the country's histories about their relationships with each other, how they developed economically and how they develop their water resource uses over time. So there is, since every basin and every region is so different, there is of course no solution where we could say one size fits all. But there are certain things that generally work very well and then they need to be adjusted to the nuances. And we had done sort of a report, which is sort of a toolkit, which presents all the different mechanisms that can be used to really promote sustainable water resource management in basins that are shared by multiple countries. And one of the, the key issues is that a lot of the activities or a lot of water resource management activities that are effective can be done at the national level, but they need to be informed by the overall basin context. And so one of the key issues is really making sure that data and information is available about the entire basin, that other countries know what are the dependencies of, of their neighboring countries on the same water resources, how much water do they need? When do they need it? Need it what for? Um, because, for instance, hydropower production is not consumptive, but it's sort of more of a sometimes a change in flow and the timing of water availability, but not really a sort of water abstraction. So, one of the key things is exchange of information between the countries, but also, and what has helped recently a lot, is this drive in really making a lot of information publicly available with the entire satellite data sets that be are becoming available and that can be used to a certain extent for water resources management and planning. And um, in order for countries to um, institutionalize or structure this data exchange, what has worked really well in basins is where countries have actually set up joint river basin organizations, where they have sort of created these platforms of structured information exchange, of structured dialogue, where they meet regularly, discuss the different water needs. Some of these river basin organizations and mechanisms have also developed um, basin-wide decision-making support mechanisms, sort of these modeling exercises that would allow countries to see what does a certain project investment do to other areas in the basin? How would it impact other areas? So that is really, um, the way of how countries can ensure or sort of work towards a sustainable management of shared resources. Um, ideally, you have an, a basin agreement that also lays down principles of management between the countries, um, information procedures, notification procedures, certain principles like environmental protection, 
polluter pays, precautionary principles. So we find that in many basins where water resource management is actually um, taken seriously by the countries and, and are working well. I mean, Europe is one of the regions which is sort of um, exemplary, but also in Africa, there's a lot of um, long established river basin organizations that are working very well. Um, as you mentioned, like Europe or Africa, for example, like countries that share transboundary basins, like countries next to the Niger River or to Lake Victoria or Drina Basin, like in Europe. And um, I found also like, like a blog post, I think, of the World Bank that these countries around these transboundary um, basins, that they're really taking proactive actions to address climate change. So are there any specific reasons why these countries towards these basins are acting quite uh, successfully as I understood it? Yeah, so a lot of it, I would say, has really to do with their history of cooperating. I mean, the in the Niger Basin, the initial commission was set up in the 1960s, so they have a history of working with each other on water resource management specifically for, you know, 80 years. Um, in Lake Victoria, also the Lake Victoria Basin Commission was set up a while ago. Um, some of the countries also historically have always had closer relationships um, and sort of cooperation is something that they had done for a long time. So these established river basin mechanisms and this culture of cooperation, which they have developed, actually helps them then to address new challenges faster in a more structured way because they, they know how to work with each other and they know how to find solutions together. Let's move to to the last question. Um, maybe it's a two two full question. Um, how did the coronavirus pandemic affect uh, your work personally, like in the legal department? And maybe like a second question, because one of the outcomes, so like the consequences of this pandemic, is of course that more and more online meetings, or webinars taking place. I think at the end of July, there was, for example, like a virtual workshop on designing legal frameworks for transboundary water cooperation. And my second question would be. Were there any concrete outcomes uh, out of this virtual workshop and about which uh, transboundary waters did you, did you speak or did you, did, you, um, did you speak about? Yeah, Yeah. so to the first part of your question, I think the COVID pandemic hit us all very suddenly. I mean, we were told from one day to the next, don't come to work anymore. I guess this happened in many regions. And, but given that we are an organization where a lot of us travel constantly, we're very well set up to work remotely. And so it was really quite impressive to see how quickly the entire institution actually kicked into gear. And within two weeks, we had the first operations out to support countries and the health services in countries that needed it with financing um, for COVID response. We've had um, an incredible delivery over the last three months of projects to really support uh, COVID response in our client countries. Um, that of course also impacted on everybody's work. I mean, we all sort of were very busy the first uh, three months of the pandemic to really make sure that all of this goes out, that everything still follows all our policies of safeguards, environmental safeguards, social safeguards, and so that um, worked really well. It was a little bit of um, a heavy lift to say. I mean, we were on calls day and night. But then what I found also very impressive is how well clients have adapted to using uh, technologies like um, Zoom meetings. Um, a lot of our meetings took place virtually to really discuss projects and, and make them effective. And this has sort of created almost a new normal. And uh, this UNACE workshop that you mentioned on the design of transboundary frameworks um, is sort of one of these examples on how quickly we all can adapt. The UNACE, sort of the UN Economic Commission for uh, Europe, is one of the organizations that has created an incredibly good platform for transboundary waters cooperation and capacity building. They're regularly bringing together water managers from all over the world, all different basins for capacity building workshops or to discuss um, certain topics like benefit sharing was a big work stream of them uh, and how to do it in best ways, sort of to do a lot of um, knowledge exchange to determine the best practices. And this workshop in particular was about developing a checklist or sort of a, 
a list of items that should be included in a good transboundary water resources agreement. And um, it sort of, it, it creates a menu because as we said, every, every basin is different. And so not everything that is mentioned in the checklist needs to go in there, but it presents all the different options of things to consider on how to structure um, substantive obligations, the correlate, correlating procedures that are needed to implement substantive objectives such as you know, benefit sharing or environmental protection or pollution management. And, and also sort of what kind of dispute settlement mechanisms should be established, which ones work well, which ones are effective, um, the importance of establishing river basin organizations. So what has come out of this workshop is a, is a draft checklist that is currently being circulated among countries and practitioners and experts to, for comments. Um, I think the UNECE will then sort of review that they tend to have a very extensive consultation mechanism to really make sure that knowledge is integrated from all across the world. Um, and then they will take this checklist and uh, update it and eventually make it available on their website. Their website is rich with resources. Another thing that works really well there and which also works very well in the virtual space is this collaboration of many, many development partners that are, that are active in the space. The transboundary waters um, management is such a complex issue that really requires many actors to try to move in the same direction. So these partnerships are incredibly important and uh, we sort of really appreciate it from the World Bank side that UNECE has sort of taken a um, leadership in bringing together countries and development partners in producing these knowledge products such as this checklist for instance. What I also find very interesting, maybe like from a legal perspective, I know there's also not like a one size fits all um, approach, but when it comes like to drafting legal frameworks for transboundary waters, what are really the main challenges or main key points that has to be um, agreed upon? You mentioned maybe I can think of dispute settlement or like uh, very precise and uh, precise um, enforcement management. So. Maybe also like from from your work experience, what are really the, the the key cornerstones or key challenges in such a legal framework frameworks for transboundary water basins? So one thing is which is very important in the upstream of developing an international agreement is really that the countries negotiating this agreement identify the areas where they do want to cooperate identify very clearly what their objectives are that they want to obtain with the agreement because that will guide the entire drafting process. And, and then of course, depending on how clear the countries are from the start of the negotiations of where they want to go and how much their objectives align, that will make the negotiation negotiations easier or more difficult. And, um, then another factor that plays in is, is different uh, legal cultures in countries. Different countries have different legal systems. Some countries are more used to resolving conflicts by, or sort of, yeah, disputes by negotiations rather than involving a, a court or an arbitral tribunal. So some countries might not be ready to include dispute settlement clauses that involve courts or third party um, decision making. And um, for them, just because culturally and traditionally, it is, is, is very accepted and normal that issues are resolved by negotiations, then you find treaties where that limit sort of the dispute settlement mechanism to negotiations. And it works very well in some basins. In other basins, you might have one or the other party then um, insisting that there should be a third party settlement mechanism and third parties can be very useful in terms of providing a neutral space for discussion or for dispute settlement. That is sort of one of the issues. The other thing that comes up is sort of really defining the scope of uh, river basin organizations. What's their mandate? Is their mandate to um, do joint studies and sort of assess the basin or do they have a mandate that is broadened in a sense of that they also can implement projects on behalf of countries that they can manage funds for project implementation. Some, some river basin organizations have decision making functions. So those can be um, tricky issues for countries really then to define 
and agree upon, but these are very important parts of agreements as they will sort of allow the, the effective functioning and implementation of agreements. Thank you very much, Christina Lay, for the interesting interview. And I wish you all the best uh, in, in Washington DC and with your further projects. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. And to our viewers, um, thank you again for watching us. Please tune in also next week on Wednesday for Political Economy. And thank you for joining us. You can also subscribe to our channels below the video itself. Bye-bye.